This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, today our scriptural lesson comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through verse 21, reading from the New Living Translation of Scripture. Notice there these words. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I'm speaking on this day, the subject simply restart. Restart. Resurrection was a divine restart. To be able to restart means that you can go back and begin all over again, but it's not going back to the place that you first began. It is being able to take the knowledge of everything that you have done, all of the mistakes that you've made, and walking in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, starting afresh from where you are. So you're not really starting from the beginning, you're starting again. It's a divine restart, where God restarts us in this life. And I want you to know that this is a time where God's prophetic voice is moving through the earth. This is a time for the voice of apostles and prophets to rise up around the globe. This is not a time for entertainers. This is a time for a mature voice of God to be spoken to the world, the heart of God, the mind of God, the pulse beat of what God has to say because God has divinely and sovereignly gotten the attention of the world. He sent us to our room for a little time out, for time to be able to think about who we are, about where we are, about what needs to change. I believe that God is giving us a divine restart. You see, the goal is not to get back to normal, but to get back to God. He's trying to call us back. The Holy Ghost is calling us back, not to normal. I know that you want to rush back to when things are normal and you can go back to your favorite restaurants and you can go back to your sporting events and you can go back to your symphonies and orchestras and concerts. But God's not calling us back to normal. He's calling us back to himself. He wants us to be reconciled. He's trying to wake up the old sleeping church. The church has been asleep for some years now. But there is a trumpet that has sounded in the heavens. It is one that is saying, awake. Be not at ease at Zion. Stand up. He's saying, stand to attention. He's saying, wake up now and be who I have called you to be. And do what I have called you to do. This is a divine time. God is giving us a restart. Thank God for his grace. That he's not just casting us out and throwing us to the world. Because he loves us. He loves us. I want you to understand that what's happening in our world today, this is bigger than the United States of America. The Bible doesn't say that God loved the United States of America. God loved the world. God loved Asia. God loves Africa. God loves Europe. God loves North America and South America and Australia. God so loved the world. This is not a time to try to figure out what I'm going to do when things get 
back to normal. No, no, no. This is a time when you get back to God, where God rekindles a fire that had grown out, where you rekindled your passion, where you ask God, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Because the old life is gone, the new life has begun. Whenever you really say restart, restart is about a divine resurrection. Where God lets you start over and is not starting on the same level where you left off. It's starting in a different kind of level. Because when Jesus was resurrected, he didn't have the same limitations that the old body did. When he was resurrected, he was able to walk through a door without anybody having to open the door. You know why? Because Jesus is the door. And so he's giving us a divine reset. A divine reset. A divine reset. And I want you to realize this. I, I, I understand that God is, is, is calling for revival in the earth. And I believe that what he has sent us home to do is to get revival. And, and when I've been praying for so many years about revival, 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 and I'm excited, excited when certain things have come on the earth now. And I see that we are poised now for a great harvest of souls to come into the kingdom of God because this is a time of revival. But I heard the Holy Spirit whisper this as I was praying for revival. I heard him whisper, personal revival. Maybe God wants to wake up people individually this time and not just the corporate revival that hits masses of people. God wants us to have a personal revival that flows out of personal relationship and personal devotion and personal prayer and personal worship. You can't be saved by what's happening in your local church because your, your parents were saved and your grandparents were saved and you grew up in the church. This is about rekindling a personal revival. How do you, when things have gotten dull and boring and and dry and insipid in your life do you awaken yourself back to the call of who God has called you to be to bring yourself back to that place I heard him say personal revival this is a time for personal revival personal revival he's talking to you personal revival this is not about your son and your daughter your brother your sister your co-worker your neighbor this is about you because when God does something on the inside of you, it will change the world. What God does, God changes the person and then uses the person to change the place. When they were all filled with the, uh, with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, that thing came down, cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them. The power of the Holy Ghost changed the person and then he unleashed them to the world and said, now you go. Jesus took people with him. For three and a half years, trained them in ministry. Then he gave them a great commission in Matthew chapter 28 and said, Go ye therefore into all of the world. I'm going to restart it, restart it now, restart it. He says, I'm going to be taken out of the way now so that you can go. I believe that this time it's not just coming through the, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, evangelists, and teachers. This time, this time, it's coming through bankers. This time, it's coming through real estate agents. This time, it's coming through retail clerks. This time, it's coming through grocery workers and postal workers where they realize that they are made in the image of God and that they carry the glory of God on the inside of them and that they're not waiting for somebody who's gone to seminary in order to be able to work the works of Jesus. I want you to realize that the people that Jesus called into the ministry, whether it was Andrew and Bartholomew and Nathaniel, when he began to call these individuals into ministry, Peter, when he called them not one person that he called that had been through their annals, uh, 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 the, the halls of, of academia in, in the seminaries. He called ordinary people. And may I tell you that he's not just trying to get something of where people are so addicted to ministering to the saints. The power of the Holy Ghost now is moving to activate the ministry of the saints. It is time now to say, God, if you can use anything in me, if there's anything, God, that you can use, use me. Use these hands. Use my mind. Use my tongue. Use my lungs. Use my feet. Use, God, what you've gifted me to do to be able to restart something. When you start this time, you're not going back and starting and just continuing business as usual. This is not a design to be able to go back to business as usual. This is a time for personal revival. Just a, a few weeks ago, my wife and I, we were getting ready to make some, some vegetable juice. She was getting ready. She'd assemble the juice. She'd cut up all of the fruits and vegetables and everything that was going to go in it. And then she went to turn the switch on and she says, there's no power. There's no power. Well, with, with me, with my mechanical self, 
I, I, I run to the basement to, to open up the, the, the panel with the switches in it. And, and, and I see that none of them, not one of the switches is tripped. And so now I'm standing there, I'm like, well, I wonder why we have no power in the kitchen. And so now I go back to the kitchen. See, God has to sometimes turn things off in order to send us on a search. Because sometimes God will change you by a divine instruction. And other times he will change you by a divine adventure. Because there's something that he wants you to learn on the journey. And so I went back to the kitchen and I looked carefully at every outlet in the kitchen until I found one that had a reset button on it. And when I pressed the reset button, pow, magically, all of the outlets turned on. I believe that God has shut things down so that it puts us on a search for the reset button. To be able to restart it and when you press the right reset button, it'll turn on every outlet that has been shut down in your life. You'll ask the right things. You'll ask the right question like God gave Solomon this opportunity and said, ask whatever you want. And he pressed the right reset button. If you press the right reset button, God has the ability to turn on everything else that's been turned off. So when he gets your heart right, your mind will get right. What you desire will get right. What you're chasing after will get right. He's not trying to go after all of these other things. All of these things are conditions of the heart. He's trying to reset something in your heart. And I worked for 10 years in information systems, in management. And every now and then we'd run into issues with the computer. And I'd have to go back to these old-fashioned things called Control-Alt-Delete. When I would do that, it had an ability to be able to restart the computer that had locked up. It would shut it down and restart everything. And this is what I believe that God is calling us once again to one of these divine times where it's control, 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 ought, and then delete. Control, ought, delete, control, ought, delete. And oftentimes, control is really an illusion. You think that you're in control. And you're really not in control. But I believe that God's trying to bring us attention to control for all of the control freaks. And you really think that you're in control, you can't even stop your mascara from running. You can't stop a pair of stockings from running. And you think that you're in control. You can't control another human being. You can't control your thoughts. You can't control your tongue. And listen, here's a, here's a real secret control, control. If you want to really gain control, you have to lose control through surrender. It is when you surrender and said, God, not my will, but thine. When you say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving that spouse to you, Lord Jesus. I'm giving my husband to you. I'm giving my wife to you. I'm giving that child to you. The moment that you surrender the opinions of people concerning you, all of a sudden, then is peace fills you. You can't control your mind. You cannot control your thoughts until you surrender. Surrender is the way to gain control. It's when you surrender your will to the will of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he surrendered, then he gained control of his emotion. Then he gained control of the anxiety. When you surrender and said, God, I'm already a dead man. I'm already a dead woman. When you surrender the control, then you can gain the control. When you give up, then you, that's when you get it. Control, control, ought. The ought button Gives you the ability to be able to hit other characters that are not available because it introduces a total, total different registration of keys. And there are some symbols and different things like, you, you know, the, the percentage thing and the dollar sign. These are, are, are things that you reach from a shift that gives you an alternate keyboard. And so you can press the same button, but when you're pressing the alt, it's on a higher registration. When you are hitting the reset divinely in the realm of the spirit, it might look like you're doing the same things, going to the same places and talking to the same people, but this time you're on a higher registration. And so you're able to hit some things and some different kinds of, of, of symbols and empowerment comes into your life because you have reset some things and now you've learned an alternate way to think. You've learned an alternate way to respond to the challenges that happen in the world. You've learned an alternate way to be able to pray. Control, alt, alter your thinking, alter your prayer life, alter your response to the way that the world is responding to you because once you 
do that, that ought will allow you to be able to get access to other symbols and things that God has on a higher registration for your whole nother plane of things that you've not seen that you can't see when you're on the lower keyboard. But it shifts you to another one. And then the delete, there are certain places that you cannot get because you're carrying things that are hindrance to you or a distraction. And if it is a hindrance or a distraction, it's got to be deleted. Too much negative energy from people that, that are draining you and, and always pulling you into things that are sinful and you find yourself having to repent over and over and over again because you don't have the courage to delete some things and some individuals from influence in your life when you have to surrender the control. Alternate how you've been handling things in the world because you've been handling them in a carnal way. Manipulating people and relationships and then being able to delete those negative influence that come into your life to try to take you in a total different direction. I want you to see how that once you surrender the control, once you alternate your thinking in the way that you pray and hit delete for those negative toxic relationships, toxic emotions, toxic ideas, self-defeating negative thoughts that are just destroying who you are. Once you do that, you'll find that God will restart you, reset you on a total different level in life. It is that time now. It is a brand new season for you to be able to move in a, in a total different realm of life. And, and as you do that, you, you discover that when God is trying to reset you, you can't be reset until you stop where you are. You got to stop what you've been doing. So he gives, as it were, a divine halt. God has halted things in our world. He's halted us. Because whenever you keep rushing on to do things, that's when you make some of the most terrible mistakes of your life. You are most vulnerable to the devil whenever you are hungry. Halt, H-A-L-T. When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, and when you're tired. If you're hungry, the devil will come after you. If you're thirsty, he'll come after you. I'm just telling you, he's coming. He knows hungry folks. If we can get you to sell your birthright, we can get you to compromise who you are when you're hungry. When you're hungry, hunger can shift your mood. So he wants to come to you whenever you are hungry. That's why you have to halt whenever you're too hungry. You got to halt and got to stop and so and partake of the bread of life. You've got to halt. You've got to halt. You've got to halt yourself. Halt whenever you get angry, because anger is just one letter short of danger. And, and so you have to halt whenever you get angry. You halt when you get uh, angry. Halt whenever you're lonely, 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 because that's when crazy thoughts start filling your mind. When you're in this lonely time and now here comes this voice, kill yourself. Here comes this voice telling you to do something freaky, something odd, something off the wall. You start becoming a receptacle. Do you know that isolation is not a good place to be because whenever you isolate yourself, you disconnect yourself from voices that have been assigned by God to speak into you. It's amazing. Loneliness, but then tiredness. Whenever you're tired, you lean more toward the problem than you do toward the solution. When you get tired, you start complaining more about things than you do expressing gratitude over the things that God has already blessed you with and over the things that he kept from coming into your life. You, you, will, you will still look for something to complain about. So always stop, halt. Whenever you're hungry, whenever you're angry, whenever you're lonely, and whenever you're tired. Because that makes you prime, a prime target for demonic activity. So halt, stop, stop, and reset. Stop and restart. Alternate some things. Surrender the control and say, God, I can't do this, but I surrender to you. I surrender my members to you. I surrender my mind to you, my marriage to you, my finances to you. I surrender to you so that I can gain control and alternate how I've been handling this thing and then delete those demonic and negative influences that have been trying to come into my life. This is a divine time in which we're living, and I pray that you're able to hear the voice of the Spirit of God speaking to you in a, in a, in a unique and a different way. I just ask you the question, what needs to be reset in your world so that you can restart? I want you to think about that. What needs to be reset in your world so that you can restart? What needs to be reset in your thinking or in your believing? What needs to be reset there? What needs to be reset in your priorities? 
What needs to be reset in your family or your relationships? What needs to be reset? What needs to be reset? What needs to be reset? It's amazing. As I mentioned, the church for a number of years now has been as though it's been a sleeping giant. And one day I was out of the park and I saw an individual that had a, I'd never seen a dog like this before, but the dog was deaf and blind. And the man was sitting on a park bench and his dog was sitting beside him sleep. And I just stood there for a moment because I wanted to observe how in the world this man was going to awaken the dog without startling the dog. How do you awake a sleeping thing without scaring it to death? And I watched him get up when it was time for him to go. And the dog couldn't hear him. He's deaf. And he couldn't see him because he was blind. And I watched him get up in the dog's face and he blew on him and the gentle blowing woke him up isn't it amazing that the word for spirit is pneuma breath or wind and when we've been sleeping God sends a wind to gently awaken us he's awaking us to people that have been deaf to his voice and blind to the signs that he's been sending. He sends a wind. He sends a wind so that we can feel the impact of the angels at the four corners of the earth. He allows us to feel the wind. A wind that is blowing, and I declare to you, a wind is blowing. Winds, winds, winds of holiness where God will call a massive repentance to come to the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. Winds of holiness, winds of holiness, winds of holiness, and then winds of harmony, winds of harmony, winds of harmony. Because when God sends something, he's not going to exempt rich people. And he won't exempt smart people. And he won't exempt pretty people. It's an equalizer. It's an equalizer. That's why there are winds of harmony. Winds of holiness and then winds of harmony. And the winds of holiness that begin to bring winds of harmony that bring us into unity then bring winds of harvest. Where there's a revival of souls that begins to move in the earth. There's a voice of God. There's a wind of God that is waking the sleeping church. Blowing on us. Sending a wind. As they were all in one place on one accord. And there he filled the house. Not the church. A house. Where they were gathered. He filled the house. May God fill your house. May he fill your house. May he fill your heart. May he fill your mind. May you experience a personal revival like you've never experienced before. I'm telling you where God begins to use everyday people. Where he uh, uses factory workers and delivery folks. Where, where he uses store clerks. Where he uses beauticians and barbers. God just wants to use People, entertainers, may he use athletes. I just pray that God will just begin to, to use different people, his spirit moving in the earth. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 says that the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Each one of you, each one of you, each one of you, this is not for a special few. This is for the body of believers. It's for the body of believers where God wants to use ordinary people. I was just looking this week at, uh, at Hulk Hogan's uh, Facebook account, and I grew up a wrestling fan. And I, I was startled by a post that Hulk Hogan had on his Facebook account on April the 6th. Where he posted this to his more than five and a half million followers. Let, let me just say what a, 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 a former professional uh, wrestler posted to his five and a half million viewers on, on Facebook. These are his words. He said, in three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything that we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I will shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I will shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? 
I will make it where you can't go to church. And then he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And this is how he closes his, his post. He says, maybe we don't need a vaccine. Maybe we need to take this time of isolation from the distractions of the world and have a personal revival where we focus on the only thing in the world that really matters, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is what a former pro wrestler said to his five and a half million followers on Facebook. I'm telling you, God will use anybody. Yeah. If you'll just rebel yourself and say, God, use me. Use me on my job. Use me in my neighborhood. Use me in my school. Use me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus. Use me, Jesus. I want you to realize that our real enemy is not a virus that kills the body, but that which kills the soul. And that which kills the soul is called sin, because sin alienates us from God. It alienates us from God. And death is not cessation, it is alienation or separation. And whenever you get separated from God, that's when we start dying on the inside. But Jesus told us in John 14, 12, that verily I say, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And maybe it's time for the world to just get used to lockdown, get used to a little quarantine as a divine cocoon because a cocoon is a womb. A womb, it's a place of transformation. It's just a place of transformation. And, and really the, the quarantine, this, this cocoon that you're in, a cocoon gives you three options. It gives you three options. Number one, to evolve. You, you evolve, you emerge out of that as to something better than what you were before. Or second, you repeat. You can go back and wind up the same old way again. Be sh shocked and afraid for a season, and then you go back to your same old ways. Just repeat. Or the third option is to die. You evolve, you repeat, you die. You evolve, you repeat, you die. When you're in a cocoon, we're in a cocoon now. Jesus' tomb was a cocoon. The quarantine is a cocoon. Let me just tell you this. Don't come out of it the same way you went in it. Jesus didn't come out of the tomb the same way that he went in it. A trial is a cocoon. Don't come out of it the same way that you go into it. Because once you're in a cocoon... You have to literally tear your way out. The caterpillar that crawls into the cocoon or spins the cocoon actually by the words, the words that it speaks out of its own mouth, its own mouth. The silk that makes the cocoon comes out of the caterpillar's mouth. The Bible says, thou art ensnared by your own words. You're ensnared by the words that you speak. You're ensnared by the words. Why do you think that with words we call it spelling? Because every time that you speak a negative word against yourself, you're casting a spell because words have power. You create a spell whenever you speak a word. It's what comes out of the caterpillar's mouth that creates the cocoon, that environment that is designed to be a transformation chamber. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Instead of just trying to find everything that you can entertain yourself with until you've played Xbox, uh, until you get tired and have watched series after series on Netflix, maybe while you're in your cocoon, you ought to say, God, I don't want to come out of this the same way that I went in it. Maybe you ought to be thinking that I ought to transform. I crawled into this as a, as a, as a caterpillar, but when I come out, I ought to be a butterfly. I ought to have some wings to where my mode of transportation and how I get around after this will never, ever be the same. Maybe, just maybe, you're not designed to come out the same way that you went in. It's time for a restart. And when you restart, you don't restart on the same level. You carry with you all of the equity of everything that you have learned from the places that you have been. I'm so glad that I didn't just go back to the womb, but I'm glad that God carried with me all of the wisdom of the mistakes that I had made from my past. Every time you get a divine restart, you don't come out of it empty. You come loaded with the benefits 
of what God has already done on your behalf. And so the cocoon, it has to be torn out. You have to break out of it. Nobody can just cut you out. If they cut you out, you won't be able to fly. The caterpillar, as it's transformed into the butterfly, has to struggle to move its own wings to tear itself out of there. And then that the vein systems that go through those wings are strengthened. And that's what gives it its power to be able to flap its wing once it has torn out of it. It almost reminds me like the heavens. The heavens. Have you ever prayed and it seemed like the heavens were brass to you? Isaiah chapter 64 verse 1 says this. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. To rend means to tear. To rend means to tear. And this is the prophet Isaiah praying to God and said, God, oh, that you would rend the heavens. May you tear the heavens open, God. We're in desperate need of you, God, to do something. Tear them open, Lord. Tear, tear the heavens open. Tear them open. open. Isaiah prayed that prayer, but the prayer didn't really get answered until Mark chapter 1 and verse 10. Notice, and when, when he came up out of the water, when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Uh, God tore the, the heavens open and sent the Holy Ghost down. Isn't it amazing? Isaiah prayed it and said, Lord, rid the heavens, tear the heavens open, Isaiah 64. And then Luke chapter 1, then he came up out of the water and immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. And the Spirit of God came down and it rested on him. It took up residency upon him. It didn't just light on him and then fly away. He carried him. He carried him. Dr. Luke, in the, in the book of St. Luke, records this same instance. In Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, he says this. Now, when all the people were, were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. I want you to notice here, Luke points out that after he'd been baptized, he was praying. There's something about prayer that helps to open the heavens. He was baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The heavens were torn open when he died in baptism and raised in newness of life, had a restart. This was a preview of what he was going to do in his death and resurrection. And praying, praying. After he was baptized, he's praying, and then he saw the heavens torn open, torn open. Because baptism is our symbol of death to self. It's the burial of the old person and then the birth of Jesus Christ and the new person that arises. And so when you die to yourself and pray, the heavens will once again open up. May I just tell you the only thing that creates a closed heaven is not some demons up in the sky, but they're the demons that operate in between your ears. It is the way you think that closes the heavens. But when you die to yourself and say, God, not my will, but your will, then you'll discover that the heavens will once again open. Can you think that the Lord Jesus can come in all of his glory and majesty and power and indwell you? And then the Holy Spirit here worships the Father there. Do you think that there's any power on earth that is strong enough to stop the Holy Spirit within you from worshiping the God who is in heaven? Absolutely not. The only thing that could stop us from that is our own little thoughts that happen right in between our own ears. No demon is strong enough to stop the worship of the Father. Nobody with a legislation, they have no capacity to stop the worship of the Father because deep calls unto deep. There's something on the inside of you that will worship no matter where you are and no matter what the circumstance. You can worship in a storm. You can worship in sickness. You can worship in affliction and in pain and in discomfort. You can still connect with God when you're in some of the most 
difficult and strange places, but you still have the capacity to connect with God. And it just blesses my life to know that God can still bring us to those places. But he loves to be able to separate God's precious people to make you feel like an oddball, isolated, as though something is wrong with you, putting you off by yourself. Remember in 1 Kings chapter 19 when Elijah the prophet was all by himself, he lost perspective and he became suicidal. Elijah's perspective was distorted. And that's what happens to you when you are by yourself because you'll start thinking, God, you're blessing everybody else. Lord, I'm the only one. And Elijah said, Lord, I'm the only one who hasn't bowed his knee to Baal. And the Lord had to correct him because he, his view was distorted because he was in isolation. Because he wasn't connected. So he didn't know. God says, I have reserved for myself. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, God says, I've reserved for myself 7,000 others. You're not the only one. But when you isolate yourself, you don't realize that there are 7,000 others. That there's a host. There's a host who had never bowed their knee to Baal. There was a host. The truth was that there were 7,000 others. And God says, I've got 7,000 others. He was about to kill himself. God says, I've got 7,000 others. You don't realize that there are, there are thousands of other folks around you that's, that believe just like you do. You don't realize you're not the only one praying. Sometimes you think that it's, it's just you. No, no, no. There are many people around the globe. This is a big world and God's a, a big God. See, the devil had taken Elijah into this place and, 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 he, and he had planned for him to, to kill himself because he prayed to die there. Thoughts of suicide had filled his life. But I just want you to know it's so interesting. The devil had a plot to isolate him and to distort his perspective, to get him to kill himself. But here's the good news, that whenever the devil has a plot, God has a plan. And I just came to remind you today that though there is a plot that the devil has to trip your feet, to cause you to stumble and to fall, God has a plan that though the righteous man falls seven times, yet he gets back up. God has a plan in spite of the devil's plot. He's got a plan. He's got a plan. And I just want you to realize he told us about that plan in Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans. I know the plans that I've got for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Some of us, many of us become so overwhelmed because we feel like the whole world is plotting against us. And let me just tell you this, God is bigger than any conspiracy in the world. While the devil has all kinds of conspiracies and plots, God has a plan. And he says, my plan for you, for thoughts of good, to do you good, to be able to prosper your life, to make you more than what you already are. God says, I have plans to be able to take you and to show you a future that you've not even imagined because I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. And he says, just trust me, trust me. And I just want you to know that we're in a season now. This is a season to begin to develop radical faith. Radical faith. When you need help, you need radical faith. This is not a time. God doesn't just answer prayer. He answers desperate prayer. When you have radical faith, radical faith produces radical worship. Out of your radical worship, you start praying radical prayers. Radical prayers. Radical prayers. Joshua prayed a radical prayer. He said, Lord, let the sun stand still. I'm in a battle. I'm in a battle, Lord, and I need some time. Can you just hold it up? Nobody had ever heard of God calling, causing time to ever stand still. That was a radical prayer, but God answered it. He answered it. When Baron Hannah played a, a, prayed a radical prayer, and said, God, I'm barren. Open my womb. She prayed like a drunk woman in the kingdom. 
She's in the temple praying like a drunk woman thinking that she's drunk. She's just praying a radical prayer. Have you ever asked God to do something that you've never seen him do? It's time now to begin to pray bold, radical prayers that flow out of your radical faith. And when you pray a bold prayer, you've got to have also radical obedience. Don't just think that God is going to send you the answer and you can live any kind of way. No, no, no. After you pray, have, I have bold, radical faith to pray a radical prayer. You have to have radical obedience, radical obedience, so that Abraham, who was willing to take his son and participate in what his mind was saying, pagan worship, by offering up his only son, it didn't make sense to his natural mind, but he had radical obedience to say, God, if this is what you're asking me to do. When a little girl by the name of Esther thought that her life was about to be ended because if you went into the king before he, he ever summoned you and he did not extend the royal scepter, you could die. And this is why she said, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going, I'm going, I'm going anyhow. I'm going anyhow. And out of her radical obedience, if you've got radical faith and are willing to pray a radical prayer and have radical obedience, God will send your way radical blessings. And I'm just here to tell you that God wants to bless your life more than it's ever been blessed before. There's nothing like the blessing that comes from knowing Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. This whole thing is about Jesus. It is not fancy, gifted communicators, entertainers, musicians, worship leaders. No. I want you to remember that Israel, they gathered around God's presence. Not even the word, they gathered around the very presence of God. In their communities, the tabernacle was built right in the middle of their community. He was the center of the community. He was the city hall. He was the town square. He was their center. They camped around the presence of God. And I'm just here to remind you that God has arrested the world to turn our eyes heavenward, to look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. This thing at the end of the day is about Jesus. It's not trying to come and to preach our best message to be able to dazzle the minds of human beings and said, oh my goodness, what an outstanding sermon. What beautiful song. No, at the end of the day, if this thing does not bring glory to the Lamb that was slain, we have done everything in vain. If what we do does not point people to Jesus, we've just wasted time. Like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, this is really about Jesus. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a religion. It's not about a gifted person. It's not about who's the hottest this and who's got the most followers on social media. This is about the King of Kings. It's, this is about the Lord of Lords. When Jesus was on the earth, the Bible talks about it in, in Luke chapter 24, in verse 27. Uh, he, he took the Bible the script that they had from the Old Testament and the Bible says beginning at Moses he began to explain to them the scriptures concerning himself he said you know everything that you've been reading about in the Old Testament it was about me it was about me but they couldn't see it because they get lost even in our modern times people get lost in their egos and their logos and their websites and their apps and this thing is not about who can have the best lights and fog machines and and sound systems and LED walls this thing is about Jesus everything that we use if it does not point people to the person of Jesus Christ we just wasted our time Jesus took us to the side as he took those folks in Luke 24 27 and start explaining to them, listen, Moses, you wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Do you know that that was talking about me? And I can see Jesus just saying, listen, 
In Genesis, I'm the seed of the woman. In Exodus, I'm the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, I'm your high priest. In Numbers, I'm the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, I'm a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, I'm the captain of your salvation. In Judges, I'm your judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, I am your kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I'm a trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, I'm your reigning king. In Ezra, I'm your faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, I'm the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. In Esther, I'm your Mordecai. In Job, I am your day spring on high and your ever living redeemer. For I know that my redeemer lives in Psalms. He's the Lord our shepherd. I shall not want who makes me to lie down in green pastures leads me beside the still waters in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes he's our wisdom in Song of Solomon he's the lover and the bridegroom in Isaiah he's the prince of peace in Jeremiah he's the righteous branch in lamentation he's the weeping prophet in Ezekiel he's the wonderful four-faced man and the wheel in the middle of a wheel in Daniel he's the fourth man in the burning fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's a faithful husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's a baptizer with the Holy Ghost and and fire. In Joel, he's the one that said, this, this thing, in the last days, my spirit is going to be poured out upon the earth and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. In the New Testament, they said, this is that which Joel prophesied about so that's what he is in Joel he's a baptizer with the Holy Ghost and with fire in Amos he's our burden bearer in Obadiah he's a mighty to save in Jonah he's a great foreign missionary in Micah he's a messenger of beautiful feet in Nahum he's the avenger of God's elect in Habakkuk he's God's evangelist crying revive thy works in the midst of the years in Zephaniah he's a savior in Haggai he's the restorer of God's lost heritage in Zechariah, he's a fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi, he's a son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Who is this king of glory? In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the Holy Ghost. In Romans, he's our justifier. In First and Second Corinthians, He's our sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he's our God who shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's our mediator between God and man. In Titus, He's a faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's a great physician. In First and Second Peter, he's our soon coming shepherd who shall appear with a crown of unfading glory. In First, Second, and Third John, he's love. In Jude, he's the Lord coming with ten thousand of his saints. And in Revelation, he's the Rey of Reyes. A Señor de Señores, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. My grandmother would have said he's bread in a starving land, and water in a dry place, and a doctor in a sick room, and a lawyer in a courtroom. He's El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. He's El Elyon, the Lord Most High. He's our Creator God, whatever we could ever need Him to be. All down through the scriptures, he was saying, I was right there through types and shadows in the Old Testament. It was Jesus concealed and then the New Testament, Jesus revealed. He was Abel's sacrifice, Abraham's ram in the thickets. He was Isaac's well and Jacob's ladder and Judah's scepter and Moses' rod and Elijah's mantle and Elisha's staff and Gideon's fleece and he was Samuel's horn of all he was David's slingshot he was Isaiah's figs and Hezekiah's sundial he was Peter's shadow he was Paul's 
handkerchiefs and apron. He was Stephen's signs and wonders. He was John's pearly white city that same Jesus. The same one that went up. The Bible says that he's coming again in like manner. And he's coming back for a people. But for you today, I want you to know that he's coming back to give you a brand new chance to press restart to reset your life what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood the blood is the only thing that can really purge your mind cleanse you from that crimson stain that sin leaves on the life when you've been molested and abused nothing but the blood there's power in the blood did he see it yes he saw it but he was there working reconciling reconciling the world back to himself that same spirit of Jesus today is reconciling the world there's nothing better that you could ever do with your life today and to say God I want to be reconciled to you I need a restart I need to be reset I need a change so that I don't go back to the same old normal. God's goal in arresting the world is not to send us back to keep us doing business as usual. This is to restart and to reset something in your mind, in your heart, in your habits, in your morality. This is a divine reset. This is not a work of the flesh. This is a demonstration of the work of God by receiving the grace that the Lord Jesus has already provided for you. It's so simple. And I want to ask you that right where you are today, thank you for taking the time to tune in and to hear God speak to your heart. I didn't come to tickle your ears. I came to allow what's in the heart of God to be reverberating in your ears. May the conviction of the Holy Spirit now, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict the world of sin. And I just want you to know that if you've been wrong, you don't try to justify yourself. You have to confess. Sin goes out of the life only through confession. Only through confession. That God, I'm wrong. I've missed the mark. I've sinned. And I'm in need of you as Savior. I want to ask you pray that simple prayer with me right now dear Lord Jesus I confess that I have sinned I've fallen short of your glory I need a divine restart come into my heart reset my thinking reset my emotions reset my desires transform everything that is in me that is unlike you Lord send your wind to shake everything in my life that can be shaken until that which cannot be shaken is that which remains live big in me think through my thoughts move through my action and be glorified through my life. Use me as your vessel to make a difference in the world around me. As you transform me, now use me, God, to transform my world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray just that simple prayer, I want you to know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has heard you and will answer that prayer in the days to come you'll see the fruit of it of the prayer that you've just prayed you watch God reset you transform you so that as you come out of this cocoon out of this quarantine as you come out of this you will not be the same but you will be transformed by the power of God to the glory of God. We thank Him. We will see you next week. Thank you 
so much for tuning in today. May the Lord bless you in a wonderful, wonderful way. Amen. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.